Um, I'm going to go right to the screen here. And um, I'm going to share my desktop. And I'm going to look. This takes us to a different, a different website from what we've been looking at. So we've been looking at Sutta Central. But there's another website that I really like. It's, it's much more humorous, but also um, I think educational. You learn a lot about the suttas by looking at this website and it's called Fake Buddha Quotes. Fake Buddha Quotes. And this, um, the um, moderator of the website, his name is Bodhi Paksha. He's a, a lay Buddhist teacher. I don't know exactly what order, order or organization he belongs to, but he's, he's collected um, what he thinks are fake quotations of the Buddha taken from mostly, mostly from the internet. A lot of them come from Twitter, um, but sometimes they're found in, you know, but they're found all over the place in books and, um, you know, um, so on and so forth. And and some of them, some of them are quite amusing, but his discussion of them and his um, sort of uh, his explanation of, uh, for, first of all, he traces where these where these so-called quotations come from. Who was the who was the person who first attributed this to the Buddha? And then he'll um, then he'll talk about whether the Buddha really said anything like this quotation, and. Um, and that's where you really, that's where you can learn quite a bit because he does look at, sometimes he'll look at passages in the scriptures that are close to the quotation, but um, still not quite the same thing. And so um, if you go through some of these, you can see that some of them are kind of amusing. Uh, a dog, actually this one, the second one here, a dog is not considered a good dog because he's a good barker. A man is not considered a good man because he's a good talker. Well, the Buddha actually never said this. Um, and uh, he traces his quote, I don't know um, uh, exactly who first said the Buddha said this, but he actually traces this back to another, a Chinese philosopher, Chuangzi, who says something very similar to this. So this is, in this case, you just have sort of um, a, quotation from one ancient philosopher being confused with um, the Buddha. And let's see, what are some other ones? All things, um, all things are perfect exactly how they are. All things are perfect exactly are, are, uh, as they are. He says the Buddha, the Buddha never said this actually. Um, and um, then we have, um, the one I really like here is a care about your children. Just bless them instead of worrying about them as every child is the little Buddha who helps his parents grow up. <laughs> uh, this is not something the Buddha ever said. Uh, he didn't give uh, parenting advice for one thing. Um, he was most of, the, most of the time talking to monks, but he never said that um, children are little Buddhas. Um, and then here's one that's really, that I really like. Chill, homie, you need to let that shit go. <laughs> not, a, a, not a Buddha quote, not an authentic uh, um, a quotation from the Buddha. But anyway, I was looking at this the other day and the thing that, the reason I'm bringing it up now, I mean, you can, I'll, I'll send the link to this um, out on the next handout, but the reason I bring it up now, because I was looking, I was looking down on this the other day, and I came to this one: life is suffering. Life is suffering. So he says that this is a fake Buddha quote. All life is suffering. Fake Buddha. Okay, so this is not really true, and according to him, and so I'm mentioning this because we had this. Um, we were talking about. Does the Buddha ever say anything is suffering? Does he use the word suffering? And um, we discussed this the last time. And this isn't quite the same thing. It's not, it's, it's not whether the Buddha ever uses the word suffering, um, but whether he says everything is always suffering. 
And he says that this, not, this isn't true. It's possible to, to find happiness in life, um, mainly by practicing the path, by meditating. And you can experience states of delight and bliss in meditation. Well, actually, we may be able to get to that today, where the Buddha is talking about the trances, the, the, the different states of meditation. Um, and indeed, he says you experience rapture or bliss or equanimity and peace and all of these kinds of things. And so for that reason, he says, uh, this is not really accurate um, to, is it not really accurate to say that the Buddha said that life is suffering. But in fact, if you then go down and read the comments, and we won't get into this, but a little bit farther down, this and his name uh, if you if you i'll send the link out to this also this specific thread and this is from a, a, someone named sebastian hello there i don't agree i do not agree with your assessment and so on and so forth although the buddha might never have literally said that all life is suffering he certainly never said that he that he saw life well lived as a source of great joy which is something that bodhi baksha bodhi paksha the uh, moderator claims in his discussion of this of this quote and so but the point is is that they get into a very interesting debate about this statement and whether this is something that the buddha actually said and both of them it turns out this 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 contributor sebastian is also very knowledgeable of the scriptures and cites many passages that which he thinks supports the view that the buddha actually said that everything is suffering or everything that's conditioned is suffering. Um, all dharmas, all entities are suffering and so on. There are various ways of saying that. And so he um, quotes a number of, of sources for this. And then Bodhi Paksha responds and they go, I think a couple of rounds. And it's actually quite interesting to read the discussion because you learn a lot about uh, just this you know, what is the scriptural uh, support for, the, for this particular idea that everything is suffering or life is suffering? Of course, we know from the first sermon that the Buddha says the aggregates, the aggregates uh, of attachment are suffering. And what are the aggregates of attachment? Well, the aggregates of attachment are all the things that comprise a human being. And, and um, so that's one of the points that this common commentator makes, this other contributor, is that, well, the aggregates means your life. You know, if that's what you are, that's your existence consists exhaustively of these aggregates. And therefore that uh, amounts to saying that life is suffering. So anyway, the only point I wanna make, I don't wanna get into this too much, is that um, people who are knowledgeable about the scriptures can actually disagree about how to interpret them. And, um, and um, that's, you know, and so it's, um, and this, is, this has always been true actually, Buddhists have always disagreed. They've, there's always been disagreements among Buddhists going back to ancient times about the interpretation of the Dharma. And, um, and so, and of course, that's no surprise because the Dharma consists of what we have something like 8,000 discourses, 8,000 suttas. And so there's a huge amount of material and, um, and it's not all entirely uniform and monolithic. It's very, the Buddha said different things on different occasions to different people. And so you get different emphases and different nuances. And if you read, if you read the scriptures, then you could very well come away with different understandings. And so it's always interesting though, for people to, to listen to people comparing their understandings because you learn a lot from that, you learn a lot from that. And I think, you know, sort of for people like us who are sort of novices at studying the scriptures, um, we can kind of feel at a loss listening to these debates. But I think for us, you know, we can just listen to them and learn from some of the ideas that are presented. And then um, I think it's okay to sort of suspend judgment. It's always 
I think it's, I think it's never good to be too certain um, about uh, what you think the Buddha said and to just keep learning and learning. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to show you. Any, any, any um, comments on that? Any, um... yeah, Jan. Uh, the Buddha uh, supposedly said that uh, if you do not agree or understand the teachings, that uh, you should reject them. Is this part? Does this come from the Pali Canon, or does? Uh, and is that in fact uh, uh, something that he would have said? He said he says something like you should um, examine them for yourselves, or that you should you shouldn't just um, accept them. You should just follow them blindly, but you should should subject them to your own um, critical examination. He did say something like that. Now that would be interesting. You know, I hope that's not a fake Buddha Buddha quote, but it would so it would be interesting to try to trace that idea back to an actual passage. Maybe I'll try to do that next time. But he does say something like that. But, um, you know, he, um, um, so he, does, he, do, he doesn't think you should just accept everything on blind faith. Hosen. Well, um, I just want to share that it, it also comes down to our own experience. And we have to experience many things in, in our lives that will bring understanding and awakening to our life. Right, excellent. And so it's, it's we, um, it has to um, resonate with our experience and we, we have to um, interpret the scriptures, at least, I mean, there, we have really no, no other choice but to interpret from, from the standpoint of our experience. And as our experience goes, as it grows through practice, then we often find that the scriptures are confirming things that we experience in our practice. And when you get that kind of resonation, then you then that's very affirming. Then you think you're kind of on the right track and you're kind of um, thinking on the same wavelength as the Buddha. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I, let's go on to the next um, the next page. Um, we had so last time we spent quite a bit of time talking about the Angulimala Sutta, but we never really got back to the um, the No Self Sutta. Yes, Hosen. Oh, John, just that uh, Michelle shared with us a chat. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not able to find my chat on this on the share page. So could you read it to me? Could you read it out? Or Michelle, can you read out your comment? Um, I just mentioned that in the Dharma uh, Pada, the Buddha talks about examining his teachings as you would a piece of gold. And yes, okay, uh, very good. Close to. So that's one, one place, very good, thank you. So that's one place where um, he says this, and I think there's several places. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Dhammapada is good. Dhammapada is a very important text. Um, all right. Um, anything else? Anything, anybody else on that? Okay, but let's let's go back to this um, this the so-called second sermon, the, the characteristic of not self. And we didn't really have a chance to discuss this amongst ourselves. And so I just wanted to be sure that. Um, we didn't um, pass over anything that um, that someone had noticed or someone wanted to say. But remember, this is where the Buddha basically gives two, two characteristics of not self. And so he's talking about, he goes through the different aggregates, right? So this is where these, so these aggregates are very important because these are the factor of that um, the Buddha identifies that comprise a human being. So when he talks about the aggregates, he's really talking about a human being. He really, but he's breaking it down into, first of all, the body, and then different mental factors. So there are, there's, there's feeling, there are your thoughts, 
There are your emotions that like desire and all these kinds of things. There are, um, uh, and then cogn cognitive states also, like you think you see a tree or you, you, you smell coffee or something like this. So this is what a human being, it's a collection of all these things at any given time. Um, and then the Buddha will also say that this collection of aggregates will change from one moment to the next. That's, that's going to another kind of level of this teaching. So you don't, you're not always the same aggregates. You're one set of aggregates at one moment and another set of aggregates, aggregates at another moment. But just, just kind of focusing, kind of zeroing in on these aggregates, he says, none of them is yourself for two reasons. First of all, he says, you can't control any of them. And yourself would be something that you can control. And the second reason is because, is that because they're constantly changing, they're suffering. That's how he puts it, they're suffering. So feeling is suffering. Um, uh, down here, um, if, it's, if it's impermanent, it's, it's suffering. Feeling, perception is suffering, and all of this, all of this, and so all of these aggregates are suffering. And if something's suffering, well, then it's um, you don't like it. It's it's um, it's then then it's something that is, something that was you would be something that's pleasant and friendly, um, and so so these kind of these two characteristics. Um, sort of the upshot of these two characteristics is that they, they um, suggest that these aggregates, this collection of aggregates that you think you are and that you've always identified as yourself um, is really something alien and foreign and, um, and something that you're actually even averse to. And so it can't possibly be you. You wouldn't be averse to yourself. Um, and so, and then he goes on to say that once you realize this, then you reject them. You step away from them. You step away from them. And then, um, then you realize this is a very bottom. Once you step away, you become disillusioned with them. And then desire fades. And when desire fades, that you're free. Okay. Now, one of the questions that comes up often, actually, it's a, it's another um, uh, point of dispute about uh, about the Dharma is whether the Buddha ever really explicitly denied that there's a self. Um, well, doesn't he do it in this in this discourse? Actually. Not totally. He says that these aggregates, this living organism with a mind that you've always thought you were, is not yourself. But he doesn't say that there's nothing besides these aggregates that's yourself, right? He just says these aggregates are not yourself. But he doesn't say there's no self whatsoever beyond the aggregates. He kind of leaves that open in this discourse. And so, so some, some people, even scholars, even very dis 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 distinguished scholars have maintained the Buddha never really intend that they're to, intended to deny that there's any self at all. He could have thought, okay, you are not this finite living organism with a mind, but there is a greater self, a universal self, the one, the whole, and that's what you are. That's what you are. And after all, later in Buddhism, the self kind of makes a comeback so that we get, when we get to the Zen tradition, um, the point of Zen is to, was to what? To know your true nature. Even sometimes it says to know yourself. And so, um, and so this is another you know, kind of possibility of interpreting this. You have some, some people on one side saying, no, the Buddha never really explicitly denied that there is a self. And there, there's even, there are even uh, discourses where the Buddha said, one should not hold the view that there is a self. And one should also not hold the view 
that there is not a self. He says that you shouldn't hold the view that there's no self. Um, but then on the, on the other side, there are, there are people and some also have some very distinguished scholars who hold the position. No, he really meant to, you know, to say that there's no self of any kind at all. And that any idea of a self, even of a universal self, becomes an attachment and a, a hindrance to um, attaining, uh, attaining liberation um, and enlightenment. Um, any, any ideas about this, uh, this sutta? Kosan. Um, it's my experience that in a given moment, there is a self that appears with consciousness. And it doesn't stay there very long but it does appear <laughs> and it disappear again by making relationship and dissolving. What do you mean by making relationship? Um, when, when the self appears, uh, if, if you cannot engage in relationship, then you're contributing to uh, the growth of this fixated entity that we call the ego. Mm. And one can go on and on with thinking and emotions and this and that, and that just kind of floating around with, but in our Zen tradition, we definitely um, teach about the experience of a self that is born in a given moment and it doesn't fixate there it disappears again the next moment and a new self can appear mm -hmm. um are you ever without a self for um more than just a few moments or for several moments or even an extended period of time a whole day or or does it does it they rise virtually every from one moment to the next. It's from one my own experience is from one moment to the next. Okay. Um, anybody have other experiences of self or no self? Yeah. Uh, Frank. Yes, John. Um, very much along the lines of what Hoshan's saying, and that is, it's transitory. And <laughs> when you think you can label it goodbye it's gone <laughs> and mm. that's the whole trick about being present you're just present but you once you start well so trying to define it and put a pickle on it or this and that and label it then it's not consciousness it's not desire it's not feeling it's nothing it's nothing and that's then it goes down to sunyata and then it becomes there is a presence but when you try to label it you can't and that's why it's transitory it, it, it's elusive Mm. And, and and that's why sometimes people have flashes of satori and they don't know quite what it is <laughs> they go on, on asking people now what was that experience <laughs> they ask a teacher they ask a priest they ask whoever the garbage man what is this experience nobody can tell them what quite it is but we know they had some kind of experience i know i've had quite a few experiences like that and later i realized i had to stop trying to define it tack it on, try to, to say what it is, but you know that you had something and somewhat was transcendental, you know, it was transitory and transcendental. And you hang in there for those moments of deep meditation when you feel so grateful and so at peace. And, uh, but you can't narrow it down. You can't, once you try to, it's like they, Lao Tzu says, he who speaks knows not, <laughs> he who knows not speaks. Once you speak about it, it's lost. Hmm. So Very good. Like, for me talking about it tells you forget all about what I just said. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else? Um, I'd like to say something. Michelle. Yeah. Um, I think also, you know, um, it's hard to pin down exactly what the Buddha said because I, the teachings were situational. So there's all, you know, if, if there's someone who's very attached to a self, then he might say there's no self to counteract the attachment. Mm -hmm. 
So um, there's always this, this kind of um, avoiding extremes of something being permanent or not permanent. And mm-hmm. the teachings are, are skillfully given so that depending on the individual mind, mm-hmm. uh, the teachings would be different. Yeah, excellent, thank you. There, there's a, I don't know which, there is a discourse of an encounter of the Buddha with, um, um, he's, he's referred to as, I think, um, an ascetic, an ascetic from a different, who had a different teacher, and his name is Vacha Gota, Vacha Gota. Mm-hmm. And he comes to the Buddha, and he, he, he's, he, he um, visits the Buddha several times, and he usually has some philosophical question that he wants the Buddha to answer. And he always gets frustrated because the Buddha never gives him a um, he never really gives him an explicit answer to any of his questions. But this time he comes to the Buddha and he says, Buddha, or Gotama, he usually addresses him, Gotama, is there a self? And Buddha doesn't say anything. <laughs> and then <laughs> Vachagota says, okay, well, is, then, is there no self? And Buddha doesn't say anything. And for and and Vajra Gota just throws up his hands and leaves. <laughs> um, and then and then there's a, a little dialogue afterward with Ananda, and I don't remember this exactly, but Ananda says, "Well, why, why didn't you, um, when he asked what when, um, uh, when he asked if there is a self, why didn't you just say no? Why didn't you give him an answer?" He says, "Well, if I had said." There is, an, there is a self, and he would have been, become attached to a self, and he would have thought that there was something permanent. That would have been the extreme of permanence. And then, when he say, then if I had said there is no self, then he would have thought that he came to me and he had a self, and then it was destroyed. And that would be the extreme of impermanence or annihilation is usually the term he uses so, so that nothing exists mm-hmm. and so that, but that, that's a good illustration of what michelle is talking about how he answered people differently on different occasions we're here speaking to the five ascetics in this in supposedly his second sermon he's really kind of being pretty direct and saying well these aggregates are not yourself these aggregates are not yourself mm-hmm. There's also sometimes a distinction that's made between relative and ultimate truth. And so on a relative level, something can exist, functions for daily life and, and so forth. And even the Buddha says I in the sutras. So Yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so right. That's, that's right. So so practically speaking, we have to we have to talk about selves, other people. We have to refer to ourselves and what we want and, or don't want and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, that's um, practical truth or conventional truth or whatever you want to call it, relative truth. But then, but then beyond that, there is the ultimate truth, the ultimate truth. Um, and yeah, what's that? <laughs> I, I wonder, I wonder yes. about, I don't remember the question that was asked of Buddha, but when he held up the flower, some people say that was the birth of Zen. When he was talking to him, he just held up the flower. And apparently Ananda was the only one that got it <laughs> at the time. And so, you know, whatever that is, but that's a kind of a cryptic, you know, th- what do you get from that? You just hold up yeah. the flower. Yeah, teach- teaching without words. So he just holds up this flower. Exactly. Right. And, and, and Mahakashyapa is the one who gets it. Mahakashyapa, yeah. Oh, is that one who was it that got it? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for clarification. I forgot. And that is, but that, that is some, you know, in Zen traditions, sometimes that is mentioned as the beginning of the tradition, the beginning of this, of this transmission of enlightenment. Yes. The interesting thing about Zen, in you know, that the Zen tradition has always said, well, we are, you know, Zen is um, a transmission of enlightenment outside the tradition, they've always said. In other words, it's not, it's, it's a direct transmission of enlightenment from uh, master to disciple. 
and, and then master to disciple again and so on and so on and so on. And it's not um, dependent on the study of scripture. Um, and, and so Zen, so Zen has always sort of de-emphasized the, um, um, the, although scriptures are chanted in Zen monasteries, it tended to de-emphasize the study of scripture as a means of, as part of practice. At the same time, there are, there have always been certain scriptures that have been very important to the Zen tradition. The Heart Sutra is one of them. Um, and um, the Diamond Sutra is another and the platform scripture and so on and so forth. So, so it's kind of a little bit um, paradoxical. But um, anyway, Zen has always maintained it's a transmission of enlightenment outside the, um, outside the, the transmission of scriptural learning. Okay, let's, let's see, we're about halfway through. I wanted to then next go to um, our sutta for today, or one of them. And this is the discourse on the simile of the elephant's foot. And what I'd really like to do is what's called a close reading of this and just kind of go through it slowly and, and kind of you know, soak it in and, and reflect on it as, 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 we, as we read it. Um, I think that this particular, as many, as many discourses, this, this is a story of an encounter of someone with the Buddha. And there's a certain dynamic, and actually there are three people involved. And there's an interesting dynamic that's going on between each of these three people that you don't pick up on immediately. And so let's just let's jump in. This is the Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. I, I sent out the, the Sujato, Bhikkhu Sujato translation, but I like this one a little bit better. So let's, and, let's, and it's a little different. So let's use this one. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove and so forth. On that occasion, the Brahmin Janusoni was driving out of Savati in the middle of the day in an all white chariot drawn by white mares. He saw the wanderer Pilotika coming in the distance and asked him, now where is Master Vajayana? So he has another name coming from in the middle of the day. So first of all, Janusoni, he's a Brahmin. Okay, so he's, he's of the priestly caste and he's driving a chariot a white, an all white chariot drawn by white mares. And so he's apparently quite wealthy, okay? So that's just one thing to sort of keep in mind. And so he is, um, and Buddha, as we know, attracted people from all walks in life. And, and but he was very successful at um, attracting people who were wealthy, who could contribute to the Sangha and so he asks this the wanderer. So he encounters a wanderer and asks him where he's coming from. He says, I've been with, with Gotama. And then he asks him, what does Master of China think of the retro, reckless Gotama's lucidity of wisdom? He is wise, is he not? And Pilotika answers, sir, who am I to know the reckless Gotama's lucidity of wisdom? One would surely have to be as equal to know the recluse, recluse Gotama's lucidity of wisdom. Um, so this is an interesting answer. It seems like quite reasonable. How, who am I to say whether he's enlightened? That's really the question. Do you think he's fully enlightened? And, and he says, well, I can't tell that for myself. I'm not enlightened. And so I can't, I can't, um, I can't see that for myself. Um, and then, but then the um, John Usoni says, but you praise uh, Recluse Gotama with high praise. And uh, Pilotika says, sir, who am I to praise the Recluse Gotama? The Recluse Gotama is praised by the praised as the best among gods and humans. So, so really I'm just sort of, uh, sort of parroting the praise of others. And then John Usoni asks him, well, what reasons does Master Vachayana see 
that he has such firm confidence in the recluse Gotama. So why do you accept this praise? Why are you, why are you going along with others and saying, oh, he's a, he's a great enlightened being? And then he gives this analogy. He says, sir, suppose a wise elephant woodsman or a wise, I think, white elephant hunter were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint long in extent and broad across. He would come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. So too, when I saw four footprints of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the blessed one is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the blessed one. The Sangha is practicing the good way. And what were these four footprints? Sir, so this, now this is very interesting. So, so what, is, what are the indications to Pilotika? Am I pronouncing his right, name right? Pilotika, yeah, Pilotika, that the Buddha is um, uh, fully enlightened. What, what are the indi indications for him? He says, he says, sir, I've seen here certain wordmen nobles who were clever, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. They wander about, as it were, demolishing the views of others with their sharp wits. When they hear the recluse Gotama will visit such and such a village or town, they formulate a, formulate a question. We will go to the recluse Gotama and ask him this question. If he's asked like this, we will answer like this. And so we will re refute his doctrine in this way. And if he's asked like that, he will answer like that. And so we, we will refute his doctrine in that way. They hear the recluse Gotama has come to visit such and such a village or town. And they go to that place, to the recluse Gotama. And the recluse Gotama instructs, urges, rouses, and gladdens them with a talk on the Dhamma. After they've been instructed, urged, roused, and gladdened by the recluse Gotama with a talk on the Dhamma, they don't so much as ask him the question. So how could they refute his doctrine? In actual fact, they become his disciples. When I saw this first footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion, the blessed one is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the blessed one. The Sangha is practicing the good way. And so that's the first footprint. And the second footprint and all of the other footprints are very similar. He says the same things about learned, learned Brahmins, about learned house, householders, about learned recluses who, um, who are planning to um, engage the Buddha, to, to refute the Buddha's teaching, to engage him in a, um, in a debate and, and um, sort of demonstrate their own cleverness by refuting him. Um, but in fact, when they come into his presence, um, they forget uh, the, you know, the problem they were going to pose for the Buddha, and they simply listen to the Dharma, and they're um, inspired by that, and they become his disciples. So this happens over and over and over again. And so these are the four, the, the sort of the, the four footprints, he says. So these are the four indications that the Blessed One is fully enlightened and that the Dhamma is, um, the Dhamma is true and so forth. Um, so they, these are the signs that Pilotika says, tell him that the Buddha was fully enlightened. Um, when he talks about the recluses, he, he adds a little bit more. He says, not only do they, um, are they um, convinced by the Buddha, and, but they become his disciples and they practice his teaching. And then they say that they have actually, um, um, become awakened. He says, now we are, we were very nearly lost. I'm looking just at this, this part here. We were very nearly, these are the, these are the learned recluses. We were very nearly lost. We very nearly perished. For formally, we claim that we were recluses, so that we were not really recluses. We claim that we were Brahmins, that we were not really Brahmins. We claim that we were saints, our huts, though we were not really our huts. But now we are, now we are Brahmins, now we are huts. So so the recluses who practice his teaching um, declare that they become our hearts, that, they, that they've um, become awakened. Um, and so 
we can just sort of stop here for a second and um, and kind of ask ourselves, well, what what about you know what about these signs that Pilotica notices? Um, what do you, I mean? What is what what is it that convinces him that the Buddha is fully enlightened and that the and that the Dhamma is um, is good? What is he talking about? Frank? Not sure. Not sure. Uh-huh. He's, he's impressed. I mean, why is he impressed with you? But he's he's impressed because he can um he's able to win these people over, um, even without debating them. You know, and here, I mean, maybe this is a, again is a kind of reference to his radiance or his charisma. Uh, maybe that's one thing. And that he is also, he's able to attract a lot of followers. Okay. I think, it, I think it also speaks to his clarity because okay. he, he encounters people who come specifically to take him on. Mm -hmm. And through his clarity, of speaking the Dharma, they are converted and all classes of people at all levels of understanding are converted. And that would be pretty amazing thing to see. Right. Very good, very, very good. And so there's a kind of, I would say, clarity and a kind of power or forcefulness so that he kind of, you know, he just, um, um, you know, He's able to clarify things for 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 people, and um, he's able to enable them to understand. And so I he's see just, why you ask me, John. He's he's, he's this he says he's this amazing teacher, right? He's an amazing teacher, and um, and some of some of the people who who um, then kind of um, become his disciples, and then actually practice his discipline. Say that they they be they, that they attain awakening, okay? Yeah, Frank, go ahead. It's because I remember that bringing up about one of the sutras I was reading talked about Buddha as a teacher of the devas, and we had talked about his presence in, in that in that uh, on the uh, in that place in the in the grove mm -hmm. that that was spoken of. And I can see what you're both all saying now is that. It's by this very nature of what you sense when you're in his presence, you don't really articulate it specifically. There's just something that comes strong over you. And then you just realize his clarity, maybe his loving, his gentleness, whatever these qualities would be, mm -hmm. that you just sense it, like you said. And, and we just start to want to be follow him. Yeah, okay, can, can I come with you and hang out? Yeah. <laughs> I really like being with you kind of thing, you know. You could imagine it, you know, I just, I could just imagine that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that we think in these terms, it's not like saying, hey, I got it, you don't, come on with me. No, it's no, he's just uh, being there, giving it off, you know. Um, when you know, I wonder about is when those other four companions, remember that he studied with before he was enlightened? Mm-hmm. I always wondered what it, what it was like when he first went to see him, you know, because they kind of yeah. were disappointed in him when he left, right? So all of a sudden he comes back, and I'm wondering what what he did. Or how he was. So, yeah, so they see a big difference, and so people yeah. people see this. So people just see this, and he's able to persuade them, and um, really, you know, convert them to his teaching. Yeah, and and so. John Usoni listens to this and he says, wow, I mean, that's really impressive. And he, he gets down off his chariot and praises the Buddha three times or something like this. But then he says, well, boy, it would be really great to me to be able to talk to myself. And in fact, the Buddha is there. He's in the vicinity. And so John Usoni goes to um, the place where Buddha is staying. He greets him and he relates this conversation he has with the wanderer of Pilotica. Um, and then what does the Buddha say at this point? He says, well, 
these might be, you know, some signs of enlightenment, but actually, um, Pilotica hasn't really told you the full story. The way he puts it is thereupon, the blessed one told him, at this point, Brahman, the simile of the elephant's footprint has not been completed in detail. I will now, as to how it is completed in detail, listen and attend carefully to what I shall say. So, so he says, I'm going to tell you what the real footprints are. <laughs> That's what he's going to say. I'm going to tell you what, what, you know, what are the real indications that um, a teacher, maybe not necessarily Buddha, is fully enlightened and that his Dhamma is well-spoken and so on and so forth. And so now, um, what, and then he, he kind of also then sort of critiques this idea of coming to sort of jumping to a conclusion about, first he talks about an elephant. And he says, you can't really tell from the elephant, elephant's footprint if it's a big bull elephant. He says, because there are also big female elephants in, in the jungle. And um, there, you would also you know, want to see other signs. You want to see you know, tusk marks high, high on the trunk of a tree or something like that. And, um, and so you really can't, you know, this just, just judging, you know, what he's really saying is just judging um, from how effective someone is at, um, at uh, having an impact on other people may not actually be the best indication that that person, that that person is fully enlightened and that his dhamma is well-spoken and that the, that the sangha is practicing well and so on and so forth. And so he says, so then how do you tell that? Well, what he's going to say is that you know that from actually practicing what this person teaches. And at this point then, he presents a fairly concise description of the path a Buddhist practice. So this is one of, one of the many descriptions we find in, in the discourses of the Eightfold Noble Path. It's not identified as the Eightfold Noble Path, but in fact, all of the elements, all of the um, practices that the Buddha explains um, in the course of this, uh, um, of this teaching are, different identifiable limbs of the Eightfold Noble Path. And so remember, actually, um, it begins with his, his declaration. And this is what we read, I think, last time, this description of a Tathagata. A Tathagata appears in the world, fully enlightened, perfect in knowledge. He de declares this world with its gods, its maras, brahmas, its generation with its reckless and brahmas, which he himself has realized with direct knowledge. So, he, so he's fully enlightened and he transmits this knowledge of enlightenment through his own experiences. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing and he reveals a holy life that's utterly perfect and pure. So this is essentially what he's been doing. You know, that this is what, he, what he's been doing in these encounters with um, the learned um, nobles and the learned Brahmins, the learned householders and ascetics and so forth who have come to him wanting to challenge him. This is what he, he declares his Dhamma to them. Um, and then he says, um, a householder or a householder's son or one born in some other clan hears that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he, cons he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty, dusty. Life gone forth from that first life, you know, sort of the life of renunciation. So uh, the life of someone who has gone forth into homelessness is wide open. It is not easy while living at home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, 
put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning, abandoning a small or large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe and goes forth from the home life in the homelessness. Um, and I th so this is the first limb of the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is often referred to as um, right view, right view. And right view is the conviction in the truth of the Buddha's teaching, essentially. That's what right view is. And here is, ex is expressed as an arising of faith. They use the word faith here in the Tathagata and believing that he is the guide to, um, to freedom, to the end of suffering. And this, then this faith is also then um, accompanied by a realization that the, that the householder wife that it's very difficult to attain enlightenment as a householder. There are so many duties and responsibilities um, in so many ways. One, um, you know, occasions for, um, um, I don't know, unwholesome states arise like desire and anger and so on. You know, we, we all know this. And so it would be much easier if I could abandon um, the householder life and enter the state of homelessness. And so therefore I shall become a monk. I will shave my head. I will put on, I, I will put on the yellow robe um, and go forth into homelessness. So this is, this is the, first, uh, of the first limb of the Eightfold Noble Path, right? If you so-called right view. And it's, as I said, conviction in the truth of the Buddha's Dhamma. It's just, it's just a sort of a um, faith. It's a kind of faith, essentially. Um, okay. And then having thus gone forth, um, uh, okay, then let's look at this paragraph. Having thus gone forth and possess, possessing the bhikkhu's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing many living beings with rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, he abides compassionate toward all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what's not given, he abstains from taking what's not given, taking only what's given, expecting only what's given. By not sealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Um, and, and so these are um, right thought and right action, where right action is, first of all, nonviolence, not causing harm to other, other living beings. It's also not stealing. But then for each of these um, forms of right action, there's a corresponding um, form of right thought. Just as one does not harm other, li uh, other living beings, one does not um, desire to harm, or does, one does not intend to harm, one has no harmful thoughts. And so for stealing, one does not steal, one does, one does not take what doesn't belong to you, but one also then should not have covetous thoughts. So there's, there's, the, there's the action part and there's the thought part. And then of course for monks, monks take a vow, a vow of celibacy. And so they practice a celibacy, Lay people don't, aren't required to um, um, practice celibacy, but monks are. And but then um, the the attitude, the mental attitude that goes with that is um, is a lack of you know is is the chastity of thought. Um, so these are these. So this paragraph covers essentially right action and right thought. So now we have right view, right action, right thought. And then, but also coming under right action and right thought is right speech. And here, I won't read this whole thing, but it involves, of course, not lying. He, you know, he, one speaks the truth, um, but one also avoids malicious or harmful speech, um, talking ill of other people. One abandons harsh speech. This would be coarse speech. 
His words are gentle, pleasing to the air, ear. And this is the tough one down here, the very last one. One abandons gossip. Um, he speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. Um, so this is right speech, another part of what's called right action. So there's, there's um, mental action, there's um, the verbal action, and there's physical action. And then, um, and then we have another paragraph, and these are um, rules that apply specifically to monks and this comes, uh, these rules come under the category of what's called right livelihood. So the, the way of life of a monk. And these involve things like um, abstaining from injuring seeds and plants, eating only one meal a day, usually before noon. Um, no entertainment, no dancing, singing, music, theater, no movies, um, no Netflix, um, no ornaments, <laughs> no perfumes. And here's the, here's the one that always kind of puzzled me. You can't sleep on a comfortable bed. No large couches. You don't possess gold and silver, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are all kinds of, and this, of course, these rules are just, they, they proliferate. You know, this is what the basket of the discipline is concerned with is all of these rules and there's a, you know there's there are many more than just the few that that's just the or the, the several that was mentioned in this particular um paragraph and so um and so um i think that will so so that so what do we have we have right view right thought um, right speech, right action, right mindfulness, not, no, I'm sorry, right livelihood. And then we're going to, there are three more that he'll talk about. One is right efforts, and then there's right mindfulness, and there's a right concentration. And um, so I'll just wrap this up, and then we'll, we'll come back to this next time, um, because I know that there's a, a lot to talk about here, and I've just kind of been you know, rushing through it, but I do want to discuss it next time. Um, but what the Buddha is going to say is that when he gets to, um, you know, so what, ha what happened to the, the elephant elephant footprints? You know, how, you know, how is he showing us the meaning of the elephant footprints? Well, he's going to say, when you start meditating um, and you attain the first state of trance or the first samadhi is the, is the word, then that is a footprint of the Tathagata, um, something scraped by the, so a mark on the tree. Um, but even then, it's too soon to, too, too soon to come to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully enlightened. So once you have this experience, in other words, what, what is a footprint of the Tathagata? Um, it, these experiences that you have along the path. Once you have the, the experience of the first stage of concentration, that is a footprint. The second stage of concentration is another footprint, the third and fourth and so forth. And then here he's going to go, and I really encourage you to go, be sure to you know, read this for next time if you haven't already. He's going to talk about not just stages of meditation, but he's gonna talk about visions that the that the practitioner has on the path, a vision of his past lives, a vision of this of, of the cycle of, of, the, of the mechanism of karma, actually. And then finally, it culminates, of course, in a vision into the Four Noble Truths. And then the realization that one is liberated and that there is no more rebirth. And that is, I don't know how many footprints he enumerates here, there are six or seven. He said, that's the, that's the last footprint. And when one, when one experiences that, then one is able to comprehend. Remember, Pilotic says, well, I, I, you know, how can I judge the lucidity of the knowledge of the Buddha since I, you know, I don't have that. And the Buddha is saying, 
this is when you can comprehend who the Buddha is. These are the footprints that, these are the real footprints that will tell you who the Buddha is. So um, I'll stop there. Do we, Pao-sen, do we want to extend for five minutes in case there are any, any questions or comments? Oh, please do, yes. Okay, so let's, um, let's open it up here. I, I've been you know, jabbering away. Roche used to say, you know, of the, of the lectures of the professors at the seminary, all they do is jabber, jabber, jabber. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Anyway, jabber, jabber, jabber. I've been jabber, jabbering. So what do you, what do, what do you have to say? <laughs> it's pretty powerful, really. And you have, there's a, there's tr a tremendous, um, you know, a lot of content, a lot of information. You have to read it several times to begin, even to get, begin to scratch the surface. No, in the, this is Michelle. In the hi. previous, hi. <laughs> in the uh, previous other translation, it was more clear to me that there were actually four footprints. And um, I thought of those as being the four Jananas, the four Samadhis. And that the, the end of that mm -hmm. is the fourth one when you become an arhat, and that's the, the end of the path as the, the Theravadans explain it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought it was interesting to kind of compare what the conclusion here is with what is on the Mahayana path. Uh -huh. Because it says here you will, um, in, in the previous translation, you will no longer come into existence. Right. So from Bodhisattva's point of view, that would be difficult. Sure. Um, yes. And then, and then also um, the, the vows, the refuges vows are taken for this life, whereas in a Bodhisattva's path, you take them until all of samsara is, is liberated. So sure. this kind of made salient to me the, the differences between the two traditions and to the absolutely excellent excellent it really does bring out the difference the difference um in the paths and the um goals yeah of of the early tradition which is sometimes called hinayana but you know people think that's derogatory so sometimes it's called the the, the path of the listeners the shravakayana um but i just call it early early buddhism and then Mahayana, where the, the, um, the I mean, the, um, the practitioner is a bodhisattva and, and, and the, you know, the intention is to become, is to liberate all living beings, not just to escape selfishly, <laughs> escape suffering selfishly and leave everybody else behind. <laughs> but that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about here. Get it, get out as fast as you can. <laughs> Anybody else? I really okay. appreciate the, the going right into the jhanas then. I didn't even see that coming and all of a sudden now we're getting into jhanas. Yeah, I've it gets, it, it I gets, I mean, yeah, they are part there. Sorry, yeah, they are part of the path. They're part of the yeah. they're part of the eightfold noble path, and he talks about them at length in many discourses. He 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 um, he goes into the into meditation in great depth in many places. So it's obviously extremely important. And here, this is even a, a rather a, a rather abbreviated description of the individual jhanas. You have much fuller descriptions in other in other um, discourses, and you also have other jhanas, the so-called formless states of meditation that are that become part of the path. And so you have a kind of there's this kind of much much greater sort of extended and elaborate, and then uh, description of the path. And then there are even in some descriptions of the path. They throw in the attainment of, of um, supernormal powers, clairvoyance, um, um, clairaudience, um, the ability to tr uh, fly, and, um, the okay. ability to multiply one's body, and so on and so forth. Those are also part of the path. 
All right, I'll I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. This is uh, amazing. I look forward to reading and rereading this text this week in preparation for our next mm -hmm. meeting. And and there's a there was another a sutta on the handout, a link to another sutta that you should also read for next week. And this is where he kind of defines in in more um, clarity and subtlety how you know right from wrong. What is so he's been talking about right action and right thought and right speech. What are what's what are the criteria for right action? And so that's that's what that other link is uh, is is um, too.